For the word on the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That is the word of God. Let him come and preach to us from God's word. It is as, uh, always a, a privilege and an honor to visit you again in uh, Kenya. You've been on my heart for many years and I'm uh, so glad to be with you today. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with the human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Let's look at this passage uh, that was read in your hearing together. This enormous stress here on the cross of Christ. Um, when Paul tells the Corinthians uh, what the gospel is, uh, he says, uh, the Christ, he says, died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again. That's what God had given to him. And then he says, uh, he was determined not to know anything among them, saying, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Then he said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ. And he had such a personal relationship with him. He loved me and he gave himself for me. Uh, you know that the Gospels, a third of the Gospels, deal with one week in the life of our Lord. There are 52 weeks in a year, 520 in 10 years, 1560 in 30 years, and then you have another 150. One week of all those years, 90% of whom we know nothing about, but one week, a third of the Gospels describe the last week in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gave us two ordinances. He gave us the Lord's Supper, the wine representing the shed blood and the bread, the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave us baptism. We are baptized then into the death of Christ and raised from baptism into newness of life. And the great hymns that we all know and sing all around the world then. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. O oh, sacred head, so wounded. There's a green hill far away outside the city wall where the dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. So there is this great emphasis on the cross, on what Paul calls the folly of the cross. Well, I want to ask this morning what it, it means, why Christ was made a curse for us. And the answer is that Christ was made to bear all that our sins deserved. 
the whole wrath of God against our sin, the recoil of God from our sin, Christ bore that. Christ paid the wages of our sin. And that involved a fourfold suffering of Christ. And I want to look this morning at the fourfold nature of the cross of Christ, the suffering of the cross of Jesus. And firstly, there was the Lord's physical suffering. There was a body prepared for the Saviour, a body prepared for him by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, a body identical in every way to your body and, and my body, a body with the same kind of nervous system, um, a body with an exquisite sensitivity to pain, um, no built-in analgesic, no built-in painkiller, uh, a body with a, a dependence on nutrients, a body with the same physical limitations, vulnerability to exhaustion, needing to re-energize by food and rest, in that body he lived, in that body he suffered. His body became a part of the holocaust of sacrifice that he was consumed by the majestic rectitude of God's hatred of sin, God's justice upon all that contradicts who God is as light and holy and just. In that body he bore our sin. Just as we are called upon to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God, he presented his body as our sin bearer to God. He carried our sins in his own body on the tree. And that body that had known hunger and needed to ask a woman of Samaria, could he have something to drink? And in that body he experienced the pain of Golgotha and all that was involved before that in the beating up by the squads of soldiers and the scourging and the immolation and the attachment of his body by nails driven through his hands by sledgehammers on the cross. All the meaning of the suspension of his body by the nails as he was lifted up, the dehydration, the effects of the sun, the humiliation that he endured there. He humbled himself. He was humiliated by the experience of death. The Bible doesn't say much about the physical sufferings of Christ because it didn't need to because they saw crucifixions every year at a crossroads going round a bend in the road they would see the remains of a man who a criminal had been crucified and outside the walls of Jerusalem there were three crosses on that day. It seems to me that one of the great comforts that we have as we face physical pain is to know that the Lord understands so that whatever extreme of agony that you may go through, you may never scream that the Almighty doesn't know what you are going through. Because he does know. There's no depth of pain and sorrow that you will ever have to go through in your lives that he has not traversed in his own. And we sin in hands sin and our eyes and our tongues sin and Jesus in his body bore those sins. Secondly our Lord experienced emotional pain. He had a human soul and a human spirit. He had a true human psychology and in that psychology, our Lord suffered. He suffered emotionally. I think you can speak of the emotional life of our Lord in an unbalanced way, 
I happen to think that it is uh, too much in the claim that Jesus is said to have wept, but he is never said to have laughed or smiled. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. And the constant emphasis in the New Testament that the overwhelming mark of a, a Christian is that he rejoices in the Lord. And when we meet, unlike other religions, when they gather in their mosques and temples, we sing together, we make melody in our hearts and on our lips to God. The mark of the Spirit in dwelling a person is joy. And it was an indispensable part of our Lord being an authentic human person that he was a joyful man. That he was profoundly contented in what God did with him when he put him 30 years to live in Nazareth and when he took him to an exhausting public ministry. He could say, I delight to do thy will, O Lord. And notwithstanding all the deprivation of his earthly existence and all his sin-bearing work, he knew joy in the Lord. It was melody in his heart to God. And we have to emphasize that because depression and despondency is normally a violation of God's will for teenagers and for newly married and for parents and for old people. They are often sinful manifestations of our own human egocentricity. We want it done at every stage of our lives our way. But we have just sung together, teach me thy way, O Lord through joy and sorrow, through all the changing scenes of life. Teach me thy way. And so Christ rejoiced, though the way was to Jerusalem and the cross. There was imaginable happiness in the life of our Lord. And yet it is most wondrously evident in the New Testament that he also knew the depths of despondency of human sorrow. We find him at the uh, a funeral, at the grave of Lazarus, and he sees Lazarus's two sisters, and they're just weeping. And he weeps with them. It's marvelous because so often we think it's, uh, it's a mark of weakness when we cry. And we apologize. I'm sorry, I, my voice is breaking. I'm sorry, we say. Sorry, and then we dry our eyes. But there was no, there's no need to apologize at all. The great mandate for us to weep is a weeping God, God the Son. And we have a right, we have a duty to weep, and pastors encourage their people to weep. We are told by Paul that we sorrow, but not sorrow as those who have no hope at all. But they are they are thinking there's nothingness. Their life has sniffed out and there's nothing. But we know of a new heavens and a new earth. We know of the resurrection of the body. Because he lives, we shall live also. He's the first fruits of all of us who sleep in Jesus Christ. When Stephen died then, the righteous men lifted him up and buried him and made great lamentation over him. It's a marvelous accommodation to human infirmity, the right of soul. And we encourage one another to cling to one another and weep when mum dies. And when my wife died, we were there, my three daughters and me, and we hung on to one another and we cried. And the first weekend when I drove off to spend the weekend with one of my daughters and knew an empty seat in the car alongside me that I knew my wife would never fill again. And I wailed. And I 
failing in justification, accepting from God illness, and accepting from God the parting after 52 years of marriage. God had every right to take her to the place of her blessedness and the fullness of joy that she knows at God's right hand now and forevermore. But I had the right to be full of tears at that time. We look at Christ and we see him in Gethsemane and he's confessing that his soul is exceeding sorrowful. Very, very, very sorrowful. The most sorrow. He didn't know that there could be sorrow like it. And he was amazed and very heavy as he contemplated the reality of the next day of Golgotha. He was amazed. It wasn't something that he took in his stride, like he'd pick up a glass of water and drink it and get on with other things. It was an eeriness. He looked at the cup that the Father had given him to drink. There was damnation in that cup. And there are times when God's will fills us with amazement. There's a pastor in London. He has six children under 13. His wife was 28 weeks pregnant and she developed meningitis and went unconscious and was brain dead. And they, last week they gave her a cesarean and another little boy. So he has six boys under 13. And was buried on Wednesday and the chapel was packed and we are full of consternation and his letters that he has sent around are full of grief and joy, full of laughter and wailing at the loss of his dear young wife. dealings with us give us loose pimples. God's dealings with us break our hearts. Sometimes the road is difficult and eventful and it is difficult by the will of God. Thou hast given us the wine of astonishment to drink, the psalmist says. We reel and stagger as if we were drunk. And here is Christ, and he can speak, and the winds obey him, and the waves obey him. And he's overwhelmed with what lies before him in the cross work of tomorrow. And he's saying, I don't know if I can manage it. I don't know if I can cope in the weakness of my own humanity. Christ afraid as he contemplates the reality of Golgotha, very heavy. Now, I do believe that Christ was totally reconciled to God's will for him, that he was there to be the Lamb of God, to take away our sin. He went to Calvary willingly, but behind the contentment and acceptance of God's will, there was an immense struggle. He sweated drops of blood and asked other men to pray with him. There's nothing unworthy in, in the suffering, in the fear when you discover the love, in the anticipation of the operation that lies before you. It really is longing for the cup to pass from him was a tribute to the accuracy of his knowledge of what the fate and desert of sin and sinners will be. And so he gave himself to these emotions of amazement and fear and sorrow. And that was part 
of the curse and the judgment. So firstly, Christ suffered in his body. Secondly, Christ suffered in his emotions. Thirdly, Christ knew social pain. Now, man is made in the image of God, and God is a triune God. God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit, and these three are one God. There's never been a loneliness in God. I pity poor Allah, the imagined God of the Muslims, and that God is alone, always alone, ever, eternally. There was no one, no one to communicate with, no one to love, just Allah. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there was communion, and there was fellowship. There was never a more loving Father, there was never a more loved Son, there was never a more loved Spirit. God is love. That's the glory of, of God, and He's made us in His image. That there's always witness in God, there's always communion, there's always togetherness. There's no loneliness, there's no isolation with God. And there's no undifferentiated isolation with God. There's always fellowship in God, and we're made in the image of God. We're made to gather like this, to gather in community to be a body, to be a fellowship, to have with us. In the beginning it was like that. Adam was never alone. The Lord came and, and walked with him and talked with him and showed his love for him there in the garden and spoke to him, was familiar with him. And yet he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm not alone. God is not alone. It's not good for the man I made in my image to be alone. I'll give him a help meet for him. And so God provided the social needs for man. God provided a wife. God provided children, a family. And when Jesus Christ became a man, he became that sort of man, a man in God's image, a man made for togetherness. A witness, and of course it was marvellous that uh, when he began his public ministry, he came from a family, half brothers and sisters, mother and father, lived with them 30 years, shared a bedroom with them, ate a meal table with them, and then when he gathered 12, why did he gather them? And you said, well, he gathered them that they could observe and they could recount and memorise and they could write Gospels, and they could preach and tell people about Jesus, and all that is true. But um, he gathered them with him, that they might be with him. He chose twelve to be with him. No, he was with God, wasn't he? There were some days he'd get up very early before big decisions and he'd go to God and he'd speak to God. Great days, great hours. Every day at the end he could thank God for all that God had been to him that day. Never was a day when he didn't have doxology at the end of it, privately, to God. So he had God. But it was not enough for the man Christ Jesus. He chose 12 to be with him. And amongst the 12, there were three, Peter, James, and John, that he was particularly close with, and one that he loved in, a, in an intimate, holy way. And it speaks so eloquently of the incarnation that he had a real body and a real psychology, that he was a real person, because we find it so hard to be alone, don't we? We need a family, we need friends to be with us. Jesus had laid hold of the seed of Abraham and assumed flesh and blood and chose twelve to be with him. 
And remember at the end of his ministry how that, that gets more and more precious to him. He stops being in Galilee and he comes to Jerusalem and he says, find a place now for us to have a meal together. And they find it, oh, I'm looking forward so much to being with you, he says. And he's with them and he sits with them and he eats with them. He speaks to them very personally about his departure, but what he's provided for them and so on. Those closing days, as Golgotha draws near, and the last night in the upper room, and then taking three into the garden, you pray with me, won't you? Come and watch with me, he says. So that he could have someone who could help him carry his burden. Why are you living without Jesus Christ? Why are you living without Christian fellowship? Why is this going on in your life? You know what the future is going to be. You're going to age, you're going to have more responsibilities. You're going to live in a little house with a, a husband or a wife and children and they're going to be sick. And why are you facing all your future alone when Jesus Christ is with us now and Jesus Christ offers himself to be our companion and friend, our teacher, our shepherd, our protector forever and ever. Why are you going on saying no to him? I don't know how often you've been to this church, but you said no to him. No, no, again and again, are you going to go on? Why are you going on without Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is willing to take you to be your teacher and friend and companion and never leave you, never forsake you. And so here he is. Yeah. And he meets them and they're sleeping. Couldn't you watch with me for one hour, he says. Simon, you said, I'll never leave you, I'll die for you. Never the great words of the, the politician, the orator, never, never, always. Now, Jesus says to him, and then they all ran away. They came through the trees, they saw the glint of the swords and the torches and the clubs they had, and they all ran. And they left him so alone. And then he hears Peter, his closest, his leader. I didn't know that blasted man. Peter says. He's alone in his desolation. In that hour, social pain, in that hour when he most needed someone to catch his eye and look at him and show him in a glance, I know what you're going through. Oh, I thank God for what you're going through. I love you so much. Not saying it, but just in a glance. No glances utter aloneness. He tread the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with him, an object of contempt by the soldiers and the high priests and the Pharisees, broken hearted sorrow by his mother and the women, and failure to his people. They all forsook him, they all fled. Um, some of you have been called to a very lonely ministry. You've been by yourself. Some martyrs had their wives there with them the night before coming to the prison, going to the place where they were burned at the stake or beheaded. They were there. 
There were Christians saying, go on, go. We love you. Some of you had a wife who stepped by you. You don't know where you've been. When everyone else misunderstood. You had a mother that cared and loved you. Jesus at the end knew enormous social pain. It was all by himself. So I'm saying to you, what does it tell us? Stand close to Calvary. That's what it says to us. Because there, in that man, there is unqualified repudiation. No one cares about you. No one understands. No one appreciates. The Lord Jesus was utterly alone. But there was a man there. Young man, a foolish man, a wicked man, and he was hanging on a cross. But grace had honed in the most unlikely person to be converted in the most unlikely place. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Evangelical group, and here I am. I never thought I'd be here. But what that man is saying is moving me. I've been sitting on the fence for too long. My family will be amazed if they discover I'm going to church. That I'm thinking of becoming a real Christian. said that when Saul of Tarsus was converted, when the thief on the cross was converted, the devil will, will want you to go on and on into what you think will be nothingness, but what I think will be followers. You, you come to Jesus Christ. Fourthly, our Lord experienced spiritual pain. All right, physical pain, emotional pain, social pain. Last of all, spiritual pain. Now let's look at that from two angles. Firstly, the pain of principalities and powers. Spiritual wickedness on the height of the hill of Golgotha throwing fiery darts at Jesus, the devil opening him up, the lid of the bottomless pit, and all the demons coming, every one of them, uncomfortable and all like a cloud of wasps buzzing around Christ and firing their darts at him. The incendiaries of doubt, the incendiaries of blasphemy, the incendiaries of despair. Now I do not say, I could not say, that they found any combustible material in the heart and soul of my Saviour. I wouldn't allow it. No conflagration. There was nothing there that could be consumed. They were all extinguished when they touched him. But the pain was there, and the darkness was there. It was in the valley of the shadow. It was the time of the authority of darkness. Christ has come, and he's uh, overcome. He's met in conflict. Colossians 2. That great fight that was going on between Satan and the Son of God. The glove was thrown down in the desert at the beginning of his ministry. And here is his climactic attempt to destroy our Lord. And he makes a, a public shame of him and triumphs over him on the cross. All Satan's <coughs> blasphemous thoughts could not bring our Lord to despair. He trusts in God through that time. And so there was the spiritual onslaught 
uh, of Satan. And then also, of course, secondly, there was the dereliction, the crying, the terrible thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was the, the final manifestation of God's anathema, God, God's curse upon sin. The curse that came in with Adam's fall and has been over the world ever since. And the judgment that comes on sin from God. And here is its climax on Calvary. And it meant there was a gulf now that was opened up that had never been there before between the Father and the Son. It meant a loss of assurance. All the comfort that we have as we've sung hymns of affirmation this morning. We've sung, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And we sung it from our hearts. We have that. He couldn't sing from his heart. A hymn, a psalm of assurance at that time. The loss of a sense of God's assistance. I don't believe that God stopped helping him. I don't believe that. Behold my servant whom I uphold, the servant song says. And God was upholding him in his agony. I believe that, but he wasn't conscious of it. Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot to God, but he wasn't conscious of the Holy Spirit's work in there. And that's what happens to us when times when we feel very dry spiritually, when we go through a winter time, when we go through days and weeks, and we wonder, are we Christians at all? And it troubles us so much. We're not conscious that the Father's upholding us and that he's with us, but he is. Through those times, he is there ministering to us, helping us. God is our refuge, a very present help in times of trouble, though we are not aware that he is there. So he lost the sense of the Father's love. He lost the sense of his Father's comfort. He didn't lose the love. My elect in whom my soul delights, God said of him. He was lovely and pleasant in his life. In his death, the Father never loved him more than when he was there loving twerps and refuse like you and me, ignorant, petty, pathetic people. But he loved us. And he wasn't going to let us go. No one of us was going to go into hell. He was going to take us into his presence and change us into his likeness. And he was determined not to come down until he'd done it for us. And our Heavenly Father loved him because of the work that he was doing. But God couldn't tell him. The love was a reality, but the sense of it withheld. The proof of that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other time that Jesus prays to God, every other time he says, Abba, Father. Every other time. But here uh, on the cross, it's God. But it isn't Daddy when he says, Father. It's Holy Father, John 17. Righteous Father, John 17. Enormous respect and love that we should all have for our fathers. But he can't say father now. He's lost his sense of adoption, of sonship. God, he says. But my God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there is faith then triumphing over the pain and the loneliness and the emotional weariness of his journey. He's full of the consciousness of the wrath of God. His sonship is obscured.
bear in mind the wonder of all that. He, he never had any experience of it before, losing God. But God was always there. In eternity, there had always been God and, and the Spirit, and they were together. And then the angels were made, and uh, they all were together in love and holiness and joy. And then he was born and he came into the world and the Father was with him in Nazareth and in his ministry. The Father was always there at the end of every day and he said, thank you for helping me to heal the leper. Thank you for helping me to speak to the woman at the well. And he gave thanks to God, he felt his presence. When he preached to 5,000 men, thank you that my voice held out, thank you that they were all there listening. And the little boy, thank you that he came with his goats and fishes. And oh, God was always there with him. And now, for the first time in his eternal experience, he is all alone. He feels so God forsaken. He called, but there was none to hear. What does he want for you this morning? Well, we know what he prays for, for all of you Christians this morning. Father, I will, that they whom thou hast given me shall be with me where I am, that they may behold your glory. That, that's what he wants for you. That's the end of it all, this great journey, this pilgrimage that any Christian here is on. And the end of it is the vision, the sight, the voice of Jesus, his face, his welcome, his delivering us from all our weakness and hypocrisy. And now, now Jesus doesn't know the nearness of God. And he doesn't know it in order that you can have it now and you will have it forever. But if he reconciled the holy God to you, a God who had seen the fire on you and known how bad you be, but loved you and determined to change you and win you. <laughs> What did the Father feel? What did God the Father feel hearing Jesus and seeing Jesus there? As he looked at his own son. Not Abraham. When he looked at Isaac. But oh, most of Jesus was a lovelier son. And God was a better father. And all the love was there. The Father looking. Looking at his son on the cross. Longing to spare him, not able to spare him, not able to hold his hand, not able to whisper in his ear, son, I really love you. I never loved you as much as I love you now. Because he was the sacrifice. He was the Holocaust. He was the beloved who must burn in the majestic rectitude of God's anger and hatred of all that is mean and cruel and petty and vile and lustful. He did not spare his own son, Paul tells the Romans. He must have longed to. A mother longs to spare her son. She hears he's having trouble in the church. Oh, she longs. Her children tell us of the problems that they're facing. Oh, we are old and oh, we wish we were having their problems because we'd be more experienced and we could bear any more than they've got so many young responsibilities. The father is looking at his son. Christ crucified, forsaken by the God who loved him. The cup couldn't pass. He must. As we told them, the good one must. I'm going up to Jerusalem. No, no, no. No, they want you. The Son of Man must suffer because I love you, disciples. I must suffer.
because I love Kenyan Christians and I must suffer to save them. The God who, the Lord who bore our sins is the Lord who paid the penalty. The Lord demanded the atonement, the Lord provided the atonement, the Lord became the atonement. He looked for a lamb and he found a lamb. But the lamb was in his flock, the lamb was in his bosom. He became the lamb that would save us from our sin. He became a curse for us. And why? Because here now we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. That's it. That's, that's, that's what he's saying to us, isn't it? That's one of his great lessons. The immorality of it, the anomalousness of it, the illegality of it, the ugliness of it, the utter indefensible horrendousness of what sin is. And Calvary, the ugliest deed in the history of the cosmos. It's ugly because of the human rejection of Christ. It is ugly because God is crucifying his own son. And I need light there. I want to be out of that black hole. I want to say this, there's reason in it because God is there. There's logic in it because God is active there. Here is something more horrific than Belson, than four men taking guns and shooting down and killing our fellow citizens. Something more horrendous than that. He was made a curse for us. That's the meaning of it all. He had no connection with the sin, but he was connected to us. He was joined eternally, unbreakably to us. He in us and we in him, we his people, forever and ever. And he was made the debtor and he was made the sin counselor, the appeaser of the wrath of a sin-hating God. God made him sin. God sent him into the far country. God wouldn't look when he cried. He wouldn't look when the Saviour fled. He did this for us. He became our substitute and God did not spare him. And we redeemed. How we love to proclaim it. We are redeemed. Our sins all forgiven. All our past sins. All our present sins. All our future sins. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us in his life of righteousness and in his death as our atoning lamb. And he's the way and the truth and the life. And he's the way to God. And God will accept us in Christ. And God will love us in Christ. And God will never let us go. He will always be with us. Because the Saviour was alone in his judgment. And there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the sinful Saviour died, sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. A God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon even you run to Jesus, you cry to Jesus, you have dealings with Jesus Christ now. As we bow our heads, you pray. And you continue to pray until you know God has answered you, until he has given you the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, of the inner testimony that you become a child of God and that your sins are forgiven. And you don't stop speaking to God until you know that God has heard you and answered you. And you tell us then. And you be baptized, and you confess with your lips what you now believe in your heart, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. And from now on, you're going to love him and serve him and work for him and rejoice in him and thank him that he never leaves you and that he works all things together for your good and he supplies all your need. And all this is offered to you.
even know. I can't understand how anyone can hear of the cross of God the Son, the Creator who became created, the Almighty who became weak, the sin hater who became the sin bearer, and that he's willing to become our Savior and we can say, yes. Who's daring to say that today? Yes. But he resisted it. He dragged him away. He said, Jesus, help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me to believe. I do believe. Help my unbelief to come. You say it. There's no formula. You start dealing with Jesus Christ. We ask the Heavenly Father to bless your word. Thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ, of your all he suffered in his body, in his emotions, in his loneliness, and the, the hatred of Satan and the judgment of God, and he did it all. Oh, struggled and won the victory and bore our sins away. Far, far, far away. And remember no more. Oh, grant that everyone here should have that saving relationship with Jesus our Lord. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen.